Good afternoon, everybody. I think that uh, we're going to go ahead and get started here. And by my clock, we're about 15 minutes behind uh, schedule on an already very packed panel. So I'm going to try to be brief uh, in my opening remarks here and get us right to, uh, to the panel. Um, so I hope everybody has enjoyed um, the, the prior session, the open plenary, and uh, the bus tours this morning. As a resident of Alexandria and um, uh, the, the leader of a local nonprofit, I'm very excited about this summit here in Alexandria. So as an introduction, uh, for those of you that, that don't know me, my name is John Frederick, uh, President and CEO of the Alexandria Housing Development Corporation, um, and it's a nonprofit that works here exclusively in the city of Alexandria. Um, what some of you, well, there's a lot of familiar faces here, uh, and many of you know me, but what some may not know or maybe have forgotten at this point in time is that uh, I worked at the City of Alexandria Office of Housing when we uh, were working on this housing master plan back in 2013. And one of the, the, the two, uh, two guiding principles or the first two principles uh, of the plan was that we were going to create a housing stock or we desired to create a housing stock in Alexandria for all, all ages, all in incomes, uh, all uh, abilities, uh, et cetera. And so that's why I'm very excited uh, to, to moderate this panel, to kind of show leaders in, in the region and uh, nationally that are doing the work to create housing that kind of stretches and, and, and uh, impacts people of all ages, incomes, and, and economics. Um, one of the, uh, the things in the city that we have um, and I will introduce and provide bios for um, the speakers as, as, I, as the individual uh, presentations. But one of the areas in the city that many people have been working on for a very, very long time and, and trying to figure out is to create a mixed income uh, assisted living facility. Uh, currently, there is nothing in the city that is affordable for folks that are trying to age in place and to need uh, that level of assistance. And that's why I'm very excited to uh, introduce Jim Edmonston, um, who has worked on a facility in our region that does just that. And I'm going to let Jim talk about that facility. But uh, Mr. Edmondson is a principal of the E&G Group and has over 30 years of experience in real estate development and finance, much of it in the affordable housing industry. In 1981, he formed the E&G Group and grew a portfo portfolio of 30 deed-restricted units and created a property management company that continues to operate today. In the mid-90s, uh, Mr. Edmondson launched and ran the nonprofit uh, Cornerstone Housing Corporation for an enterprise foundation which profitably uh, accumulated and preserved a portfolio of over 5,000 affordable apartments in markets around the country. Uh, Mr. Edmund has a bachelor's degree in economics from Princeton and an MBA from University of Virginia, and I'm very pleased to uh, introduce him to talk about his project or the project Chesterbrook uh, Residences. Thanks, John. Uh, I was just sitting in on one of the previous sessions in the auditorium, and one of the speakers uh, talked about using church properties, underutilized church properties, as a, uh, as a means of um, uh, uh, financing and getting affordable housing of all types developed. Um, that's certainly what we uh, did with Chesterbrook Residences. Um, uh, the, the, the speaker, I think Kathleen Turner, um, who I didn't know, um, talked about a, a, a genesis that took from um, uh, the, the start of the process for the church that she's, she's a part of in 2013, and maybe they'll deliver it in a couple of more years uh, if all things go as well. Um, it makes, it makes uh, uh, our effort at Chesterbrook seem like a short timer. Um, uh, this, is, this is the building. It's not an ideal picture. It was taken in the middle of the winter. Um, uh, it is a beauty, um, and uh, it, it is um, 97 units. It's uh, uh, 109 beds. Um, and there's another story about that, um, but uh, it, 
it, it's, it was not done with low-income housing tax credits, which is also something that I'll, I'll get to. It's located on five acres. You, you can go to the next, thanks. It's located on five acres, about half of a church property that was Chesterbrook Presbyterian Church that was um, one of these declining con congregations that was down to having 20 or 25 members, almost all of whom were over 65. They wanted to use the land for something productive. The church was not sustainable. Um, and uh, the, the, that congregation decided that, gee, let's, uh, let's, let's do an assisted living project that focuses on the elderly. So then the question was, how do we get it done? Um, they, uh, they came, uh, the presbytery, in the process of closing down Chesterbrook, came to um, Lewinsville Presbyterian Church, my church, and uh, which had successfully developed uh, uh, a property known as Lewinsville Retirement Residences uh, using a HUD program that still exists and is still one of the great models for this program in the country. Um, uh, Lewinsville recruited two other congregations, Emmanuel Presbyterian and Temple Rodef Shalom, to join in the development of this project. Um, the, our genesis was seven years. Um, the, our, our pastor called me in. I mean, he knew what my work was as an affordable guy. Um, in December of 2000, and we finally delivered this creature in November of 20, uh, 20, uh, I'm sorry, 2007. So it was almost exactly seven years. Uh, Macedonian will wind up being nine years, uh, I guess. Um, uh, the, um, well, you, go, to the, go to the next slide. Um, the, the financing was novel. Um, uh, we, we used VHDA financing. Uh, they issued tax-exempt bonds uh, at, a, at what, at that point, seemed like a fairly attractive rate. In this day and age, it stinks, but that's, that's such is life. Um, it was about $11 million for that. We raised $1.1 million from the members of the congregations and some, some uh, very public-spirited uh, uh, corporations in the community. Um, the Fairfax County granted us about a million and a half dollars in various stages along the way to, to make the deal work. Um, but most significantly, the Presbytery leased the land for 75 years for the outrageous upfront price of $1. Um, and this, this land could have been sold for McMansions at three and a half or four million dollars. Uh, it was not consistent with the mission of the, of the Presbytery nor the goals of, of um, the Chesterbrook uh, Presbyterian Church. Um, it also had something else, and I'm sorry for breaking my arm as I pat myself on the back. It had me, and I was free. <laughs> we, 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 we also had a number of other brilliant businessmen and dedicated folks, um, and uh, it's, it's not likely that that is going to be um, uh, something that every congregation can do, uh, even if it has um, uh, free land. Um, next. Just to, to give you uh, some ideas of, of the economics, um, we have 44 uh, housing vouchers. Um, that, are, that are all going to, to um, uh, low income. Uh, they, they don't have to be elderly, but they in fact are all elderly. Um, uh, all, of, all of whom have incomes of well below 30%, most of them just living on Social Security and maybe something very modest beyond that. We, in addition, the economics of the deal have permitted us to, to internally subsidize five additional units at very, very steep rent discounts. We have 45 uh, or more market rate units. I say market rate because they're, they're less expensive than Sunrise, but they're still uh, fully charged um, uh, units uh, and beds. Um, and, and it's not like somebody who's, who's worth millions of dollars can move into those market rate units, uh, even though we have a bunch of those folks in McLean and Great Falls. Uh, and Falls Church, which uh, this project serves, um, their VHDA has limits about the percentage above uh, uh, area median income that uh, that uh, these properties that it finances can serve. The, the monthly charge of a market rate unit is is at least about sixty six hundred dollars per month. So, 
you, you've got you, you've to be providing good service. You have to find people who are in a certain income niche in order to be able to do it. But the combination of uh, the rent that they pay and the service charges um, that go along with the, the rent in an assisted living complex um, create a significant profit margin. I say profit. It's a, it's, we're a nonprofit, but it's a call it a surplus. And that surplus permits us to collect much less rent, uh, and in fact, in some cases, virtually no rent, uh, from the, um, uh, the lower income people at the project. Other, other key factors that uh, really define the ability to make a, an affordable assisted living facility work. Um, the, the assumption is that there's, there's, there are needs beyond just warm and dry uh, that the residents of this place have. We get volunteers from three very healthy, very enthusiastic congregations. Frankly, I don't know what we'd do without them. Um, and I think it's very important if, it's, if, if uh, we're going to have such a successful venture in Alexandria, an affordable assisted living facility, that it be connected with community organizations, if not congregations, to help make that work. Um, we have a great property manager uh, uh, that, that is more than just uh, re real estate guys. These are human services guys. Um, CSM is the name of the company, and they, they work uh, all around Virginia. Um, I, I tell people all the time, I wish my for-profit ventures were as successful economically and programmatically as this critter is. Um, we have a great model. We've, uh, over, over our, uh, what is it now, t um, 12 years, 11 years of operation, we have accumulated reserves over $5 million. Um, nobody is ever going to leave Chesterbrook because they simply run out of money. Um, uh, if, if people need extra support, um, we, we've got the resources to give it to them. Um, it's, not, it's not a perfectly replicable model. Um, the, the, uh, we, we, didn't, we didn't have to pay developer fees. Uh, we, didn't have, uh, we, di we didn't use a program like low-income housing tax credits, uh, which now we might be able to use. It wasn't, a, it wasn't an option back uh, 12 years ago. Um, uh, and and the, the, the land values, you know, fi finding a way to convince a landowner, whether it's the city or churches, to put, that, to put that land in at very low cost is, is hugely helpful um, because uh, if, if we're going to have a very substantial number of very low income residents, we're not going to get full, full rents and service fees from them. Um, the world is changing. It's very different right now in the assisted living world than it was uh, when we were considering this uh, seriously. Uh, Geez, as long as 15 years ago. Um, more people are staying at home, and there are facilities and services that allow them to stay at home. We have to, we have to identify people who are um, uh, in need of support that they can't get at home. Uh, and, and that means our average new resident is older and frailer uh, than he or she was. I say he or she. Typically, in assisted living facilities, 85% of them are women, uh, or more, even, even 90 or 95%. We have, we have uh, uh, people, people have joked with me that one of the great things in, in um, elderly life is being a man in an assisted living facility. Um, the, uh, the, there, are, there are people who are staying so long. We have some original residents still. We have people who moved in in 2007 and 2008. They're still there. They're frailer. Memory is an issue. Um, we cannot provide uh, uh, serious uh, Alzheimer care the way others assisted facilities do, but we're, uh, we're enabling people to stay longer um, than we anticipated when we started the process. Um, it's, a, uh, it's a labor of love. Uh, I'm so proud of my involvement and what uh, these three congregations have done for the community and obviously our former residents and re current residents. Thanks. Um, 
Jim, I, I've toured that facility uh, on, on two occasions, and it really is a, a spectacular model. And I think that we would be lucky to have something like that in, in Alexandria. And just for those of you that have not read um, the, the housing master plan, that is one of the goals of the housing master plan. It's also a goal of the Office of Aging plan is to create a, a mixed income assisted living facility in, in the city. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't give a shout out to Bill Harris and Bob Eifer who have been working, <laughs> working on this. Shame issue. on me for not recognizing <laughs> Bill. They've been working on it for a very, very long time, and I think it's something that would make our city uh, that much stronger. Um, so um, to, to that, um, assisted living facility is obviously very important, but in addition to uh, that, there's just areas for um, aging seniors that don't maybe necessarily need the whole care uh, that an assisted living provides. And uh, our next speaker works for an organization that provides that type of housing in addition to all types of affordable housing. But uh, Wesley Housing uh, Corporation has, has really made a, a name for themselves providing senior housing that has kind of a, a lot of services that come along with it that kind of stop just short of an assisted living facility. So with that, it's uh, my pleasure to um, introduce Camilla McAfee, who is the Vice President of Real Estate Development of Wesley Housing Development Corporation, a nonprofit affordable housing developer that works throughout the greater Washington, D.C. area, including the city of Alexandria. At Wesley Housing, Camilla leads the real estate team on all development transactions. Prior to her work at Wesley, Ms. McAfee worked as a project manager at Forest City Enterprises and the director of public finance at the D.C. Housing Finance Agency. Please, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Ms. McAfee holds a bachelor's in finance from Georgetown and an MBA from American University. Please help me welcome her. It seems like eons ago, though. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Again, my name is Camilla McAfee, Vice President of Real Estate Development at Wesley Housing. I'm going to quickly just go through a little bit of background about Wesley and then talk about some of the project representative projects that we've done uh, that are, have uh, been inclusive through the use of some creative partnerships. Wesley Housing was founded in 1974 out of a social justice mission of uh, the Methodist Church uh, districts in Arlington and Alexandria. Um, over our 45-year history, um, we've developed over 2,300 housing units in Northern Virginia, as well as the District of Columbia. Um, we've um, currently own and retain about 1,800 of those units um, and manage. We're kind of a multifaceted uh, real estate development company. John spoke about uh, the fact that we, in addition to real estate development and ownership, uh, we also manage those units as well as provide resident services. Uh, the portfolio is, again, based throughout um, Northern Virginia and the district, um, and uh, we entered the uh, district about um, three years ago now in 2016 and currently own about 200 units there. I think the next uh, slide um, talks a little bit more about uh, location. Um, so uh, the majority of our units are kind of dispersed between um, Fairfax and Arlington, uh, but we do own about 210 units in the city of Alexandria um, that we've uh, developed over uh, the past 20 years. Um, we uh, have a significant amount of senior housing. About 25% of our units uh, are housing for other seniors age 55 plus or 62 plus, depending on the programs that uh, they're financed by. Um, and we also incorporate a significant amount of special needs housing, so housing for uh, folks with disabilities, um, and maybe uh, HOPLA housing ho folks, people living with AIDS. Um, and we've been uh, a mission based in that regard. We've served the missions of many of the localities that we've partnered with. Um, so over those years, we've developed as small as a six bedroom um, group home uh, up to 193 unit high rise building family style. Uh, I can go to the next slide. So again, um, you know, how we do this, we consider um, all the deals that we work in uh, true partnerships, either um, with, um, you know, through the utilization of uh, the financial tools that are out there through the federal and state um, governments, but also the localities. Um, the localities um, have been great partners in providing land, capital, and operating funding as well. Um, and the mission, setting the goalpost, um, deciding um, you know, what needs to be built, how it needs to be built, where it needs to be built, um, where the needs are. 
Um, we've also uh, forged a lot of uh, partnership with the faith-based faith -based communities. I think um, Jim's example there, as well as many others that I've heard on some other panels that I've sat in on, it is a great opportunity. Um, uh, many of the faith-based communities have land and they have an aligned mission, and we've found opportunities um, developing in partnership with them. Um, in addition, um, beyond uh, the land and the um, wherewithal and the, and the um, uh, the vision to provide the affordable housing on uh, co-located on those sites. More importantly, um, we found you know it's helpful to have partnerships along the services side. So Wesley Housing's um, resident services group operates four family community resource centers at many of our properties, and those are typically uh, funded in partnership with the localities. Um, but then we and we also have an additional five uh, properties um, that provide a level of supports for our senior and disabled housing communities. Um, and some of the services range from financial literacy training, job readiness classes, computer training, um, even Zumba, right? Uh, I've heard someone uh, give an example of the Zumba as the great equalizer of rhythms and um, experiences. So it brings everybody together. Um, we also partner with a lot of institutions. So George Mason University has been a great partner um, uh, providing uh, not only uh, the workforce opportunities for their social work interns, uh, social working, social work students, uh, master students, but um, in those come they come in and intern with us on our resident services side, leading a lot of the programming that we do at our sites and um, helping uh, to forge partnerships with our residents. Beyond the properties that we actually have funding for, um, we also provide a baseline of resident services that we call resident stability. Um, it consists of eviction prevention and workforce development supports. So we have dedicated staff that Wesley Housing partly subsidizes um, that provides these supports to all of our residents across the board. So when someone becomes behind in rent, um, oftentimes um, they're not aware of some of the resources that are available to them, either through the locality, through church partners, through others for emergency rental assistance, um, for other um, ways to subsidize uh, their living costs. Um, sometimes they need help finding a better job or um, they might have lost a job and are experiencing a slight dip. And so uh, we help them in that regard as well. Um, I can put the next slide. So some of the representative properties um, that we've uh, found partnerships in, in building inclu in inclusivity. Um, this is a mixed income project that we did in Arlington. It was a site that Wesley Housing owned since the 80s. It consisted of your typical uh, two to three story walk up post-war housing. Um, five buildings, 50 units um, in the top left, and it's probably small to the folks in the back, but that was a representative of uh, the buildings that existing, existed on the site. There was a huge opportunity through um, the counties um, uh, had gone through a, a small area planning process in Fort Myer Heights North, um, and this is just south of Roslyn Metro Station, so it's very uh, transit oriented and proximate. And so there was, in right off of Route 50, um, there's a huge opportunity to increase the density uh, significantly there. Um, we took this site through the site planning process in partnership with actually a for-profit uh, developer, Bazuto Development, um, who is also um, has been a fortunate mission aligned. They've done a lot of tax credit uh, development in the past and senior housing development and so forth. And um, beyond um, you know, them being a uh, you know, uh, for-profit um, market rate developer, they do a lot of affordable housing development as well. And so we found an alignment and mission with them and with goals and with being able to make sure that we could support the um, affordable residents at our prop at this property. And so it's a, 40, a unique 40-60 um, split, so 40% affordable. Um, again, if you recall, I said there were 50 existing units. We were able to increase the affordable density up to 78 units and a significant amount of three bedroom units. I believe we tripled the number of bedrooms at the site for the affordable housing units. Um, so that was a success. We were, it, we were required to retain two of the existing post-war housing uh, buildings, and that's what you see in the foreground there in the picture in the middle um, it, as a historic element. Um, and so whereas, um, you know, we would have liked to be able to build just one single efficient tower and be able to incorporate those units, it actually yielded for a better site plan. Um, we have some... Uh, 
some um, public open space in between the buildings. As well, we were able to incorporate all of the three bedroom units in, the three, excuse me, three bedroom affordable units in, um, in the, uh, the existing uh, structures. Um, there's one for one parking here. Um, the affordable residents have access to all of the amenities and that's kind of some of them are lying down the bottom there. There's of course the fitness center. Um, there's a business center, places that people can reserve to use um, for their own personal uses. Um, you know, coffee in the lobby, that type of thing. Um, the uh, leftmost picture at the bottom there is an interior of a unit. The finishes in the affordable units are the exact same as the market rate units, so therefore, where there is stainless steel backsplash in the market rate units, there's stainless steel black backsplash in affordables and stainless steel appliances and the like, so it's, um, we're really proud of that one. Go to the next slide. Um, the next one is a partnership um, with Fairfax County. Um, Jim talked about something, the genesis to um, completion being a long time. This is one of those. Um, and I will say that at the point in which Wesley um, Housing got involved in this project, it had been on the uh, books or you know in the planning stages for, for much longer than that. Um, so it's a site um, that housed a former um, Fairfax County Public School that had since been converted into uh, 22 independent senior living residences and an adult day health care center and a senior center and a child care center. So it's a true um, mixed use, um, mixed um, community uses, public use um, site. Um, and, uh, but it was, you know, built in 1945 and inefficient and, you know, of course, um, asbestos and lead-based paint and all that stuff that you don't want your preschoolers around. Um, so we demolished that building, um, you know, took the site through, of course, a, a site plan uh, rezoning public process, um, uh, separated out the uses, but they're still maintained on uh, the same campus. Um, and we were able to um, increase the number of affordable units from 22 to 82, retaining those 22 units had an existing public, uh, um, excuse me, uh, HAP contract on them, a, a, a rental subsidy contract um, that makes sure that residents only pay 30% of their incomes uh, regardless of the rent. Um, and then uh, we were able to increase the density for uh, the other senior units. Um, and, and then the county, Wesley Housing did all the infrastructure for the site, so you know all of the storm, uh, water, gas, lines, so forth, um, uh, and uh, the roadways, and then the county, and, and we delivered a pad site to the county to build their public facility behind. Let me go to the next one. So the last um, case that I wanted to share was is in the city of Alexandria. Um, this is still, um, it's not yet built. Um, we're planning to uh, go under construction on this later this year. I think uh, this was at least uh, driven by on the bus tour this morning. I, I unfortunately was not able to attend, but um, my understanding it was um, uh, driven by. So this is in partnership with uh, the Fairlington Presbyterian Church. Um, it's an 81 uh, unit um, building that was entitled last year and uh, has the support of uh, the city uh, for additional funding. Um, the church had gone through a discernment process to decide um, uh, what they wanted to uh, do with their land. They actually have a, a mix of, of um, community benefits that they currently retain at the property. They have a, a school that they house there. They house other uh, faith-based um, communities there other days of the week. Um, but they found that housing was one thing that they also wanted to uh, be involved in and uh, commit to uh, supporting the city's master plan. Um, and so uh, Wesley Housing entered into a partnership with them. Again, took it through a site plan process. It'll be a four-story uh, stick-built um, uh, wood frame um, uh, construction uh, with one story of below grade parking, um, one for one with the units, um, a mix of one, two, and three bedrooms, so true family housing and, 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 and an increased number of two bedroom units, two and three bedroom units, um, and, uh, and rents at 30, 50, and 60% of the area median income. Um, 
it will be universally designed. So, and in, in just like um, the false, Falstead, the prior project at um, Lewinsville Center, um, universal design means uh, that the um, building will be able to accommodate uh, folks as they age in place. Um, so, you know, there's always a certain number of units that you're required to have full accessibility on. Um, but making sure that you have universal design features allows you to be able to convert uh, additional units for uh, aging in place um, more easily. Um, and obviously wider hallways and, and, and lower uh, reach uh, for other facilities. Um, so that really concludes um, the cases that I wanted to talk about and I'll take any questions afterwards. Thank you. Thanks, Camilla. I think if um, there's one word that folks should take away as they leave this summit and just in affordable housing in general is partnership. Um, many of these projects, almost all, uh, have various partnerships uh, from the faith-based community to various funding sources to the city government, to the state governments, uh, to the federal government, and, and, and nonprofits, private developers. It's just, uh, it takes a lot of folks to get one of these deals done. And one of the, uh, one of the greatest partners here in the, in the city of Alexandria that does a lot of work to um, preserve housing or public housing for uh, in the families at the, at the lowest income of the spectrum is, is the Alexandria um, Redevelopment and Housing Authority, and that's why I'm excited to uh, introduce Sarah Scott, um, who serves as a development manager at ARHA, overseeing the development of the 52-unit multifamily uh, building Ramsey Homes and assisting in the repositioning of ARHA's portfolio. Prior to joining ARHA in 2018, Sarah worked as a development manager at Sarah, uh, Somerset Development Company, providing support with development projects, asset management, and resident services programs in Washington, D.C. and Baltimore. And prior to Somerset, she uh, worked as a research assistant at uh, uh, Virginia uh, Center for Housing Research and served as AmeriCorps VISTA in com with community housing partners, Architects Design in Christianburg, uh, Virginia. Ms. Scott has a bachelor's degree in architecture from University of Virginia and a master's degree in urban and regional planning from Virginia Tech, and she's here to talk to us about some of the work that ARHA is doing to preserve our public housing. Good afternoon. Uh, I just wanted to give you all an overview of kind of the services that the Housing Authority provides, uh, some of the redevelopments that have taken place and kind of our vision forward for housing for all. So, here we go. <laughs> so we currently have um, 1,100, 400 units, uh, 11, or 1,140 units in Alexandria, uh, 754 of which are public housing. Um, we serve all of our residents, um, we have a property management team, uh, asset management, uh, resident services and finance department all in our headquarters in the city. We also have 1,400 uh, housing choice vouchers that we administer and we have a plethora of resident programs but I kind of want to highlight a few today. Our family self-sufficiency program, um, our Ross program and part of our Old Town Commons redevelopment, our James Bland Five supportive services programs. But overall, for the last 80 years, our ha has managed the city's public housing units and provided affordable housing, economic opportunities, and a living environment free from discrimination for low and moderate income residents of the city. Um, we have a double bottom line of providing the bricks and mortar of the physical units, but also providing the economic opportunities for our residents. Give you an overview, just looking at the uh, map of the city, kind of where our public housing uh, properties are located. To give you a better understanding of the public housing, um, our funding from Department of Housing and Urban uh, Development, we have operating fund and a capital fund, and unfortunately, the capital needs for public housing units across the country exceed funding uh, by four times. And annually it's decreased by 53% in the last 15 years. Um, so because of that, our, the capital fund is subject to annual appropriations. So one of the things I'll be talking today is about how we're looking to kind of reposition those assets and give our residents and our portfolio a little bit more uh, sustainability. 
So a little bit more about um, some of those resident services programs. Um, our Family Self-Sufficiency Program is a voluntary program for our public housing and housing choice voucher residents. It helps families become uh, financially independent. They set short and long-term goals, uh, both personal, educational, um, and uh, professional goals. Participants are eligible to um, create an escrow savings account, so if they uh, get a raise at their job, they can then and their uh, rent goes up because your rent is based on 30% of your uh, income. So if their rent goes up, then a portion is deposited into this escrow account. And after they reach their goals, hopefully after five years of being in the program, they get to um, take that amount in the escrow account. So on average, um, it's about $7,000 um, in that escrow account when uh, our residents graduate from the program. Um, and then our Ross program is um, an additional pathway to success for educational engagement, empowerment, and employment training. Um, and it's kind of, the goal is to graduate to that FSS program, but we have uh, 50 active Ross participants. I'll speak about our Old Town Commons uh, redevelopment that we saw on the tour today, but part of that redevelopment, uh, we have a HAP contract, so um, a Section 8 contract on 54 of those units, and part of that redevelopment, um, the limited partner uh, agreed with ARHA, set up an agreement for supportive services for all of those residents. Uh, so it provides outreach and programming and the overall focus on uh, wellness and um, for our residents to achieve sustainability and we provide uh, additional resources to them. So we have 65 active participants in that program and we've had graduates um, of the program go on to buy homes with all three of those programs. So very successful resident services department at ARHA. Let's touch a little bit more on our redevelopment side. Um, this is Chatham Square, our first major uh, redevelopment property um, in the city of Alexandria uh, back in 2005 with our partner EYA. Uh, it replaced 100 distressed public housing units, uh, 1940s um, World War II housing. Um, and it's a true mixed income property. We have now there are 100 market rate townhomes and 52 um, public housing units on the site. And you wouldn't be able to tell where those units are. It um, is completely integrated into the site with eight back-to-back -back buildings with four market rate townhomes on the street. And then we have uh, two interior courtyards and six public housing units are within those interior courtyards. Um, and they appear to be four townhomes. So um, there were originally 100 public housing units here. Only 52 remain after the redevelopment, which was completed in 2005. So part of our, um, the Housing Authority's agreement with the city, uh, Resolution 2876, I believe it is now, um, is that any um, housing that's redeveloped in the city, um, the 1,150 units, they will all be um, retained, and it's a way to preserve all of our deeply affordable units throughout the city. So when this property was redeveloped, 48 of the units were um, relocated, scattered across three sites that we call uh, Braddock, Whiting, and Reynolds. And just to mention that this uh, was also funded with 9% tax credits, a HOPE 6 grant, so um, a HUD initiative to replace uh, dilapidated public housing um, through mixed income communities. Old Town Commons, which if you were on the tour this morning, you saw um, another mixed income redevelopment, uh, five blocks, eight and a half acres, uh, formerly 194 public housing units. Now it houses 379 units. Um, 245 of those are market rate between townhomes and condos and 134 affordable units between public housing and the 54 units that I mentioned at James Bland 5, uh, which have a Section 8 HAP contract. So um, this was large partnership with EYA and the city um, between 2008 and all the units were completed by 2014. 
four separate phases, four separate 9% uh, tax credit applications. Um, and here as well, 60 of the units, um, of the public housing units that didn't come back were relocated to other areas in the city, um, part of our Alexandria Crossing Glebe Park redevelopment. And then right down the street, Ramsey Homes redevelopment, it's currently under construction. Um, it was 15 units of public housing uh, developed in 1942. We're tripling, over tripling the number of affordable units here. Uh, it will be 52 units in a four-story building um, with 15% or 15 units still at that uh, 0 to 30 percent AMI rate and then 11 units 30 to 50 percent AMI and 26 at 50 to 60 percent AMI so still 100 percent affordable um, it's a 0.71 acre site and well integrated the design well integrated into the uh, community so I wanted to give you an understanding of kind of all of our other properties and where uh, we're looking forward to repositioning our other public housing assets. So going back to the conversation of the annual appropriations from HUD um, declining, we don't have that stability. Um, knowing that we'll be able to redevelop the public housing um, to the same effect that we would if we did have Section 8 uh, funding on these properties. So HUD rolled out an initiative called Section 18 um, last year, and it gives us the opportunity to um, put Section 8 project-based vouchers in these public housing units. So we submitted an application in June, um, and we're still waiting to hear back from HUD on a certain number of our public housing properties, but it's giving us the ability to hopefully increase the amount of subsidy we have and then greater uh, provide greater affordability and larger be able to sustain um, our units through the future. So our other, as we go through this repositioning initiative, our other tools are RAD, HUD's Rental Assistance Demonstration Program, and then their Voluntary Conversion Program um, once public housing authorities have 250 units of public housing or less. Overall, public housing moving to a Section 8 contract on these properties means we're no longer subject to annual appropriations from HUD's public housing Section 9 program, and it allows for greater funding stability. Um, so we can leverage financing with uh, potential development partners and better fund the gap that we all know is there when you try to develop affordable housing. So um, we want to increase the number of affordable units, and we're able to do that if we move to the Section 8 model. Um, hopefully we could develop more with 4%. Uh, uh, the developments I spoke of, Ramsey, uh, Chatham Square, and Old Town Commons were all developed with 9% tax credits, uh, so it's a competitive process. Um, improving the worth of these properties also means it will be in an advantageous position uh, to share and potentially share in the cash flow of a redeveloped property um, and have equity and the ability to refinance and it allows us to develop a truly mixed income uh, property and serve a larger share of that zero to thirty percent AMI uh, population that eludes a lot of affordable housing developers um, and our goal too is to bring amenities to all of our residents um, just like Camilla was saying, that all of our residents, low income, market rate, have the same amenities. So looking forward to our development principles. Um, we want to move away from putting replacement housing out in other parts of the city. If we're redeveloping in one area, we'd love to bring back every single affordable unit to that site and all units at that 0 to 30 percent AMI. So that is our goal. And then if we can increase the number of affordable units, that, um, that is our ideal scenario as well. So having that ability to hopefully get more income from a Section 8 contract, we could, our target is to have maybe a third of extremely low, that 0 to 30 percent, even 0 to 60 percent AMI, um, a third workforce housing, and a third market rate. Um, so our capacity really is 
figuring out that subsidy if we can move to that Section 8 contract. We have our lot of value in our land, part of the redevelopments with Chatham Square and Old Town Commons was because of that value in the land, especially um, in Old Town and our uh, Parker Gray neighborhood. And then key is partnership. So um, finding that right development partner that aligns with the same principles that we have. So overall, um, our strategy is repositioning, redevelopment, and also resyndication. So Chatham Square, BWR, we're at the end of our 15-year tax credit compliance period. So resyndication is when we'll be reevaluating what we're going to be doing with those properties. But overall, we need to diversify to become financially sustainable um, and to reduce our operating costs. And this potential with Section 18 and RAD are our best path forward. Um, and repositioning allows us to have a more aggressive strategy where we can really bring back as many amenities to our residents and hopefully have more resident services for them and even increase the number of affordable units at these properties. Um, so overall, we want to promote the improvement of the physical, social, and economic fabric of um, our community and improve the lives of our residents. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, as uh, many of you probably picked up through um, that presentation, one of the, the goals of affordable housing as we move forward is to have mixed income communities. Uh, mixed income communities can mean a lot of different things all in one building mixed within a building, but the idea of, of uh, in integrating affordable housing within our communities. That's why I'm glad and uh, excited to ex uh, announce or introduce James Simmons, who has been working on mixed income communities throughout uh, the country um, and, um, and can share with us some examples of that work that he has done. So uh, Mr. Simmons is the managing partner and CEO of Ashland Capital Partners, where he serves as the head of the investment committee. Uh, Mr. Simmons has over two decades of experience in real estate investment throughout the United States, as well as New York City, including specifically in Upper Manhattan, where he is both a resident and a pillar of the community. At Ashland, he runs the day-to-day -day operations where he focuses on sourcing and structuring transactions through his deep relationships across the public and private sectors. Uh, Mr. Simmons holds a B, uh, bachelor's degree in science from uh, Princeton University in electrical engineering and computer science and a master's degree from, um, uh, I'm sorry, Northwestern in uh, the School of Management and Finance. Thank you. Um, I don't know if I'm a pillar of any community, but thank you for, <laughs> thank you for saying that. Um, so before I get into the, the presentation, I, I think that I should talk a little bit as to how I got into this business because uh, I think it's indicative of sort of what we do and how we got to where we are. So I did a stint uh, in the public sector where um, I was CEO of an organization that was charged with revitalizing of Manhattan. And at that point in time, what we were trying to convince owners of doing was reinvesting in their assets. And we could not do so. Um, the business model that they had been raised with, and why I say raised, many of these individuals had acquired their properties and owned them for um, 20, 30, 40 years. Some were actually second and third generational owners. And the business model was simple. It was you buy it, you hold it, you invest as little in the asset, you take as much out, you refinance in a tax-free way, and you live off the cash flow. And so when you sit across the table with someone uh, who has that mantra, it's really hard to convince them to say, you know, you really should reinvest in your assets because if you do so, not only will you be able to achieve higher rents, but your tenants will take better care of the asset. So if the asset looks like, um, if it looks horrible, then people are gonna treat it horribly. And so um, when I left that job and went to the dark side of private equity, um, I said that if we could acquire these assets and acquire them at below replacement costs, which means 
below what it costs you to build it today. Um, and we reinvest in it. And also create these, in many instances, naturally occurring mixed income buildings. The people who are coming in who are paying market rent are going to de facto subsidize the people who have been there for a long time and paying which in New York City is rent stabilized rents and rent control rents. And so we ended up building um, a business doing that and we put out about a billion dollars. And we did it in a for-profit fashion, um, which means that our job was to make money, make money for ourselves and for our investors. But at the same time, we were improving the lives of individuals who were in those buildings and we were also improving the communities around them. Um, and we did so without having public policy in mind, even though we, I worked very closely with electeds, with tenant groups and the like. But um, one thing that was very important is day one, when we acquired an asset, I met with the tenants. And I outlined what our business model was, which is we're going to reinvest in this asset. But the onus is as much on you as, as it is on us as owners to take care and police your other tenants because I don't live here. My objective is to create housing that I would be happy to live in. And we don't own anything, nor have we ever, where I personally would not want to live there or raise my children there. But having that cooperative partnership is really important. Um, so I thought that was uh, key to give you guys some background on who we are. Um, we spent a lot of time and effort coming up with a mission, philosophy, and strategy. Um, but I basically told you what it is, right? Um, we're in the for-profit business, but we're in doing it differently and doing it the right way. So each of our transactions really started with a problem that we, um, through our experience, um, can come up with a solution that other people can't. Uh, the first case is Riverton Square. Uh, the problem was that, um, a little bit of history about the asset. Um, New York City, um, post-World War II, um, and MetLife came together. New York City said, we'll give you the land. MetLife, you finance it, and you build housing, um, really for returning veterans. So that was Peter Cooper Village and Stives in town. Um, and uh, they also built Riverton Square. Peter Cooper Village in Stuyvesant Town was exclusively white, and River, uh, Riverton was black um, because of segregation back then. Uh, so both assets were acquired at the peak of the market um, in 2000, in the early 2000s, it's called 2006, 2007. Um, the groups that acquired them overpaid, they overlevered, they went into default and distress. Um, and so that was the story of Riverton. We ended up acquiring it and um, the, over the period of time of distress, um, there was disinvestment. And so through um, my connectivity with the city of New York, we fashioned a transaction whereby we would get a 40-year tax abatement. We would lock in the affordability of 80% of the units. We had 20% that would market. Um, I think to date, we've invested about $25 million in the asset, including facades, boilers, um, elevators, and the like. Um, we have partnered with uh, three nonprofits that service the tenants, um, one for seniors, one for um, the general population and one for children. Um, we built, this is um, a community center that we built. Um, so uh, that's a, a $225 million um, transaction there. Uh, case study two is Park Lane Apartments. So the problem there um, was that it was under the auspices of middle income housing program in New York City. Um, it was due to be eligible to leave that program in 2021. Um, it had been disinvested. Um, it needed about $10 million 
of capital improvements. The only way to um, to finance that actually would have been to raise rents under the prior program that was in would be to raise rents to the residents, um, uh, which was not tenable given the incomes of those individuals. So um, again, we acquired this um, in April of last year. Um, I negotiated a 35 year tax abatement with the city um, alongside of uh, the existing asset, which is here in the back, um, we rezone the parking, which will allow us to build two additional buildings, um, 155 units for seniors, uh, and another 274 units for families. 100% um, affordable. Uh, the existing building is middle income, let's call it um, anywhere from, uh, we do have 20% uh, Section 8, but everyone else makes between 80 to 135% of AMI. Um, we have um, one of the only pools in the Bronx um, that service our residents. And so we're in the middle of this transaction. Um, we're in a $5 million facade job, which will be done in about a, um, the end of the year. And we plan on starting construction in January on the new site. Uh, this was an interesting deal in Chicago. Um, we, the problem was it was a vacant warehouse. Uh, it was an emerging neighborhood, uh, which today has emerged. It's West Loop. Um, the most famous thing about the West Loop at the time that we bought it was that was where Oprah Winfrey's studios were, um, but nothing else was there. So um, we uh, knew that the city, well, we had worked, I had worked with the city. Um, was doing a new L-stop proximate to this site. Um, so I partnered with uh, the owners of the building. Uh, we renovated the uh, top two floors for multifamily, partially affordable, um, as well as uh, uh, activated the retail. Um, we had a child care center there, um, a yoga studio, and some other uh, community-based uses. Um, that transaction really came out of our identification of the need for housing in this area, um, where prior to there had been very little, if any. And then last, which you guys really care about, because it's here, is Heritage at Old Town, um, which is at 431 South Columbus Street. Um, I've had a, a long history. Um, I launched my firm a year ago, uh, but prior to that, um, I was at a large private equity uh, platform where we acquired this asset. Um, and the problem there was that uh, it's about 140 units of affordable and the balance is market. And there was a big gap between um, what our market rate units were commanding versus what the market was. Uh, so our, our objective was to improve the asset um, the, such that the market rate units could, uh, uh, um, could attract higher rents. Um, and uh, make life better for all the residents. Uh, we, we accomplished that and did that, but along the way, uh, the city of Alexandria, um, as well as some other stakeholders, came together and said, you know, we really should do a small area plan because we have an extreme shortage of affordable housing. We have a shortage of housing to begin with, um, and this particular site is underdeveloped, so let's talk about doing a small area plan. So the city took the lead in that process, and we worked cooperatively with the city. Um, that culminated about a year ago, and I recently acquired this asset, my new firm, to continue that process. Again, importantly, the preservation of the affordable units that are there, and, and actually uh, our future plan is to expand the affordable housing there um, over the course of the next couple of years as we work with the city um, on a redevelopment plan. Um, but importantly, everyone who's there um, will um, hopefully will be able to keep some portion of them there while the redevelopment occurs, but everyone will have the opportunity to come back and be in a truly uh, mixed income um, community. Thanks, Jim. 
Uh, first, an announcement. We got there's a cell phone with a rose gold case that was left in the ladies' room. That's in check it uh, in the check-in area if that belongs to anybody. Uh, we are over on time, so I don't think we probably have too much time for questions. I'm going to look to Helen and see if we need to to cut this down. Is that is that assumption correct? Okay. So I will. Uh, take any question. There's a microphone there if you'd like to, to step up and ask the question of the panel. One thing, Sarah, could you ask um, that for those of us who couldn't go on the bus tour, if that could be posted on the website so we could do a self-drive tour ourselves to see these projects. Secondly, for Mr. Edmondson, um, what, how do you deal with these residents who um, have to proceed to the continuum of care when all these assisted living projects aren't covering that? How is that dealt with? It's a problem. One, interestingly, maybe not a direct answer. We, we have uh, that microphone. No. Oh, it's on. Okay. Um, my my uh, church, Lewinsville, um, uh, runs Lewinsville Retirement Residence, which is a congregate care facility. The, the Falstead, right down the road from us, Wesley's project, um, is an independent living facility, and. We're, Chesterbrook Residences is a, is a um, uh, assisted living facility. That 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 is sort of within everybody within a couple of miles. It's, it's a continuum of care uh, opportunity. When when a uh, when a resident gets to the point because of memory issues or uh, frailty issues and can't stay even in an assisted living environment, then it's. The, the, the family, if there, if there is a family, has, has to deal with some very difficult questions. Um, back, to, back to home care with, uh, with uh, extended services, uh, nursing home care. Um, um, there, are, there are constraints, financial constraints, about what a, uh, an assisted living facility can, can do. Um, some, of, some of the commercial assisted living facilities, Sunrise being the best example, has um, uh, memory care in a lot of their facilities, and they have some facilities that are almost now completely memory care. That's very expensive. Uh, there's no there's no affordability attached to any significant part of that. Did, did, did I address the question at all? Well, it yeah, it's it. it uh, I have never personally had to be involved in one of those conversations. Uh, it would just be extremely difficult. Um, but, the, but the family knows it, and it's not something that you, uh, you call the family into a meeting and say, you're out of here tomorrow. Uh, it, it's, it, this, is, this is something that happens over time. I, I will say I'm getting the thumbs up that the uh, tours will be posted so that people can do a, a self-walking tour. Sure. Yes. Yes. I mean, it, it, there, there's a there's a limit about just how much frailty can be accommodated in the building, but it is not unusual now for the market rate residents, and even occasionally with some special services for the for the residents in in the discounted units, to have people come in for eight or more hours per day to offer a dis, a, additional aid. Um, so that they don't have to leave quite so soon. Uh, it's, uh, it, it, it's a problem uh, in every kind of an assisted living facility. I'd like to uh, take the opportunity to thank our speakers for, for making time on a Saturday. Um, and, and also, as, as uh, someone that works here exclusively in the city, I think that we uh, owe our staff at the Office of Housing a lot of uh, gratitude for putting this on today. It's just a really great event. And thank you all for being here and taking time on your Saturday, this beautiful Saturday afternoon, to address this very important topic. Thank you so much.